Welcome guys to another episode of Home Ed Me podcast. So this is Sid and we are on session number five, looking at science with the amazing Gemma today. So Gemma has joined us. Uh, she's had a long day. So we're going to keep this a shorter session than we, what we normally do. Um, but she's going to be talking to us about what she does as a scientist. Well, she's a tutor now. Um, and then we're going to take a journey through to um, her through her life and what she's doing right now and she's going to give us some top tips of what you guys could be doing at home during the lockdown period. So Gemma, welcome. Thanks, thanks very much. Thanks for having me on. It's great to have you on. So for those of you that are watching for the first time, do subscribe, Home Ed Me podcast every Thursday at 3.30. Um, so Gemma, tell us a bit about your life. How did you get to where you are now, starting off from school? So what kind of subjects were your strengths and what was your journey? Okay. Oh, so um, I've always been interested in science. Science has always been a thing. Um, I was really bad at languages at school. Um, and, and actually later on, when I got to university, I was diagnosed as dyslexic, which made sense looking back as to why writing was such an issue as well. Um, so when I was in year five, I was still having handwriting lessons in school. So for me, sciences and maths were the things that I could really ace. So I think that's why I naturally went towards them. They were things that I could see, things that I could do that actually made sense. I could do an experiment and it would come out and I'd go, okay, I can see why that works. And that proves to me that it's possible. Um, whereas, whereas history and English, they were, in, they were interesting, but they were less tangible for me. Do you remember a particular period during your primary school life where uh, you did a science project, you did something exciting and it was a, a turning point for you? Yeah, we had new science labs built and I remember being so excited when they opened because they had gas taps and it was like the most exciting thing I think I'd ever seen. The idea that we could use Bunsen burners, which in, like, in primary school you don't usually Ooh. use them. And then the idea that it was redone and we suddenly had these gas taps and everybody wanted to use them. And we were all, every, every time we went into science class, it was like, can we use the gas taps? Can we use the gas taps? <laughs> so they they was... do salty, don't they? And especially for year sevens that go in and to a lab for the first time. But it's really unusual for a primary school to have labs. So I think you were very lucky to have that. We were. Yeah, we were incredibly lucky. And the building, the building work, I think, corresponded when I was about in year five, which was when I was having the extra writing lessons. Um, and the extra writing lessons ended up happening in the science lab. So oh, wow. I don't remember much about the writing, but I do remember about being in the science lab, <laughs> probably being very distracted. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a tap. There's a tap. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think your, so that was your turning point. I remember when I was um, in year five and um, I moved schools and it was the first time I had homework. So the previous school I was in, they didn't set any homework. It was a big novelty for me. And it was a science project. And the science project was on space. And I Perfect. remember spending day and night working on this project. And back then, we didn't have laptops. We didn't have Google. We didn't have the internet. Um, so I had to uh, get books from the library and drawing images. And I won first prize. So that, that was my turning point. Because I remember that. I loved it. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that got me into it. We didn't have anything fancy like your gas tubs. <laughs> yeah, I think it was that. And then I was also part of the gardening club when I was at primary school. And I think that's something that's just, I, I, I tell my students that are, that are um, obviously on lockdown at the moment, I'm like, get outside and get gardening because yeah. it really is seeing science working. And part of part of doing the gardening club was you, you got to do the gardening, but we also did dug up and explored about insects and as a child I was really big fan of pond dipping and anything I could kind of get my hands on that was outdoors and to do with plants I loved plants as a kid I really love plants and butterflies butterflies are stuck with me unfortunately I can't actually look after a plant anymore <laughs> I feel like I'm just cursed but butterflies are still there <laughs> This is where I'm the complete opposite to you I don't like outdoors I don't like insects I don't like bugs um, <laughs> And I, to be fair, when I was younger, I remember when I was four or five, six, I used to love playing outside and I used to love ladybirds. They were my fascination. I used to go find them. And then they used to poo on you, the yellow stuff, I'm assuming yep. you poo. And um, they used to get clever. So after, like 
initially when we used to find them, they used to be fine. And then after a while, they start pooing on you to get away from you. And now I have nightmares about ladybirds. <laughs> I literally have nightmares of like a swarm of ladybirds chasing me. Oh dear. <laughs> I don't know. Been... We had, um, what was it? I was on Skype, I was on Skype to, a, to um, a couple of friends of mine a couple of weeks ago and we got, it's not a butterfly. It's, they've been taking over the UK. They are, they're quite big insects. They're probably about that big. It's got a big body. Um, I can't remember for the life of me what they're called. They've got really interesting antennae and everything. And my partner and I would just drop the drop the computer. Sorry, guys, we can't do the quiz. We've got to get this insect because it's in our house somewhere. Um, so we had a fun moment of kind of running around trying to catch it <laughs> during one of your live sessions. Uh, not during not during teaching. During uh, uh, an online quiz that I was doing. Oh, <laughs> I did. I think I was doing a YouTube live, and um, there was an insect or a bumble, I can't remember what it was, but it flew and it scared me. And I, I, li I literally shrieked in the middle of the <laughs> session. I was like, ah, I'm gonna get rid of this. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't deal with them. So you, you were into all, all the outdoor stuff. Did you go camping? Did you go in, and do all, did you do Duke of Edinburgh when you were older? Um, I didn't do Duke of Edinburgh, um, but I did, I did a kind of similar thing where it was, it was kind of similar world challenge-esque. So yeah, I am I am quite an outdoorsy person. Um, I've got a camper van that that oh, wow. uh, me and my partner Josh go and, and stay stay in and, and do a bit of walking and climbing. And uh, yeah, the outdoors for me is is quite a big thing. So, and I guess that's nice when um, you do a lot. You do a lot of your work online as yeah. well. So that's nice for you to be able to have that outdoor and and get away from looking at the screen all the time. Yeah, um, it's it's really important to me to be able to just get outside because as you said I spend a large amount of my time just at a at a screen and um, a lot of my students aren't in the UK they're they're elsewhere and, and so I work with sometimes some weird time out hours as you know and, and uh, just being able to step outside and and be outside is quite important to me. I think the closest I got to um being out outdoor outdoors it wasn't really outdoors I used to do floristry at secondary school so, so did my partner he used to do it as well <laughs> I joined out in year seven there was a club and then uh, the lady retired I think I was in year 10 at the time so I did it for four years with her then she retired and I took over oh really and I did it and uh, so I used to get all the equipment and every speech day, so the, the, the official event of the year in school, we used to do all the flower arrangements. So I used to get a team of students together. Um, but that's as close as I got. And with that, there's no insects. It's like the flowers are amazing. They're like, no insects. <laughs> Either they're plastic or they're real and they've been sprayed and stuff. So there's nothing that I need to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> did you find anything unusual in your um, outdoor digging? Like, did you find bones or... Like yeah, I've got them. I've got like a, uh, I look over there because cause they're mostly over there. I've got a big box full of stuff that when I do in-person tutoring, I take with me. So we've got different types of pine cones from different trees and like big ones to small ones. And they open out as as they get older and they get warmer. And that, that means that their seeds can come out the sides, um, which not many people know about, about pine cones as they open out. Um, some people do. And then we've got fossils and I've got, there we are, I've got. Is this everything that you've collected yourself? Um, yeah. So this is, this is one of the ones that I take around the pencil case uh, just to show people because I don't think many people necessarily realise what they're like. So that's uh, it's called an elephant's toe. See, I've, I've got stuff, but I've had to pay for it because I don't go and collect this kind of stuff. Yeah, I see, I pick it up. <laughs> I pick it up everywhere. I bring it back and uh, yeah we've got loads of it so I think my partner's probably fed up uh, we've got a skull somewhere of some animal that I've brought back I've got in the skull I've got most things so oh, that was just found, found it and um, I'm quite lucky I live in Oxford so uh, we live near Blenheim, Blenheim Palace and, and that's what we found that so yeah, I, I, awesome. think it's, I think probably your um, collection is probably going to be more fascinating because you've got a story behind each thing that you've um, found <laughs> that you can tell to the students I'm just like yeah I bought this <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I quite enjoy I quite enjoy it and sometimes you meet students who really love it and sometimes they're just like yeah Jenna why are you showing me that I'm like, but, but look at it <laughs> look at how interesting it is <laughs> they're like mm, no <laughs> 
yeah I think when you when you start working with teenagers they can be like that I think because I work a lot with the younger kids they're all fascinated by what if you're excited they get excited <laughs> yeah yeah a large amount of mine are, are teens but mm. but I also get again because I do some some residential stuff um I've had some really great times with students who are similarly kind of enthralled with the outdoors so I, I I'm really really love I went to um I went to Hawaii with one of my students and I had like the best time we went snorkeling we saw giant turtles giant turtles and it was it was like this is amazing um and she she was really into to sea life and creatures and she could point out all the fish as well I was like this is amazing this is perfect for me um so sometimes I don't do some really great things like that so that's uh so when you talk about you, you do residentials, because that sounds really odd. You went to Hawaii with your student. <laughs> so I'm assuming you're, you're teaching and then that's, is, are the experiences as part of the learning? So do you arrange those as part of the learning or do you just That wasn't. To... Um, sometimes parents do ask me to, to do it. Typically when I'm working residential with a student, um, we, will, we will be working towards a specific exam often. So often they're international, they're looking to come to the UK um, to come to a specific school or because they're, they're moving here. Um, and I'm out there usually preparing for exams or preparing for GCSEs. But as part of that, I mostly live with the family. Um, and therefore, if the family is doing something, but then I will typically do it. Um, and, and also with those types of roles, because you're living with the family, you sometimes might just go oh I noticed that this is happening so earlier this year I was out in New Mexico we went skiing um, and that's a perfect point to talk about forces and to talk about air resistance and just to bring that in but ultimately it's it's kind of an activity that you're doing mm. but but you can also you can also sit back in the classroom after the day and go you know how this happened this is a perfect example of when this type of force is happening or this is you know this is a perfect example of streamlining so it's really great when i do residential stuff that i can just bring a lot of what we do into lessons because science is everywhere so that's the best thing about it and i think it's really it's probably really unusual for the teachers that are listening um that you have that kind of relationship with your students because it's very different from a classroom where you've got that sort of distance um between you and the class and you don't build that relationship but it is a big um market out there where people do um do residentials because i've and, and homeschooling as well where families um look for teachers to come and live with them and, and teach the kids and so how how does that impact on your day-to-day -day then because uh, you're up and about then a lot of the times yeah so um i've residential i've done residential work for about three years mm -hmm. um and i do my online that's why most of my stuff is online because i take it with me so often my students don't necessarily know where i am uh, so they're like oh are you in Oxford and I'm like no I'm not <laughs> I'm actually in China or <laughs> I'm in I'm in the US um, and I I'm one of those tutors that only take short-term residentials so there are a, there are a few long-term residentials over a year you know six months yeah. because um, because my partner Josh he's a he's a musician um, he lives in the UK he's not moving um, therefore I only take short-term stuff so often I work with families long-term but I'll go out with them and travel with them on a short-term basis so that means that I often end up going on holiday with them um, or traveling if they've got a second home elsewhere then then I'll go with them then it's like a different world from the average person in the UK that they can so it's much. unusual yeah <laughs> yeah there's there's some really amazing perks of it but it is an incredibly hard job because yeah. you live live with them you are under quite a bit of pressure with it, it it's it's quite unusual there's only a few of us that probably do it but. there's a lot at stake as well because their the expectations are high um they're investing in a lot in their education and they they want results so yeah. it's a lot of pressure on you yeah yeah there is uh, there is some of that as well so going back to we've kind of jumped the wagon Sorry. a bit <laughs> go, no it kind of led nicely into it but going back to um your school days i think we went we were still talking about primary but going to secondary did you still have that kind of love for science and um and outdoors throughout your secondary life as well 
pretty much yeah um i i went to an all-girls school uh all-girls grammar so i took the 11 plus oh, high five hey <laughs> so yeah i took the 11 plus um went off to to grammar i uh, loved loved like everything that it gave me um obviously what i think everyone probably goes through who who is a, a teenage girl goes through that point where they maybe don't want anything to do with going outside and, and becoming self-conscious and and all of the all of the wonderful things that kind of surround that that were amplified in my girl school um but but also me i i loved it there was a boys school that was opposite us and they did combined cadet force and i joined that uh, quite early on because it had some of the stuff that i was looking at for it i wasn't particularly good at it but i enjoyed it um and so that meant that every summer and a couple of half terms i would go off to cadet camp and that would involve quite a lot of walking and you know getting all cammed up and sleeping outdoors and and all the stuff that <laughs> yeah <laughs> all the stuff that makes you do that <laughs> but uh but for me it was great um and there was only a few girls that did it um but but the, what, those of us that did we had an absolute blast doing it um I think my biggest nightmare okay. with, with like being outdoors is just like what about the toilet like what about <laughs> the toilet like there's no way i can go to the toilet outside like no way because what if there's a, a spider crawling up your leg or something oh, i could not do it i cannot i don't know about spiders um i got bitten by a horsefly at at cadet camp and my hand swelled up like fully swelled up and um, someone said it looked like a looked like someone had blown into a a glove and oh, that wow. was my hand <laughs> um, turns out i'm allergic to them um and that was on the last day so i came back from one cadet camp with with a hand that was three times the size of the other my mom took one look at me and was like what have you done <laughs> and sent me back into school the next day so <laughs> how long did it take for it to uh, go down the swelling I use, you take antihistamines and, uh, and it goes back down and I've never been bitten again but it was uh, just a, an odd thing that happened. <laughs> so what subjects did you pick um, at A-level then? Biology, chemistry, physics, maths. Oh wow, just straight yeah. science, all sciences. <laughs> yeah um, and, and in fairness looking back like I've, I kind of wish I'd picked psychology um because it was something i found interesting but i did struggle when i was doing my gcse's with just essay writing and mm. i didn't realize then i was dyslexic i had mm. no idea well I, I had an inkling but everyone had, had basically said no nah, that can't be because you did well in your gcse's etc and it meant that i then picked the a levels that i thought i could probably do the best in yeah not necessarily the ones that i would have been the most interested in um I mean, I love them, but I, I, you know, I, I may have taken something else had yeah. I got to grips with the essay writing. I think I had that issue with history. I loved it, but I missed um, an A star by two marks, two marks. <laughs> um, and uh, again, I, I, I struggled with writing and I've not been diagnosed, but I'm pretty sure I'm dyslexic because there's, there's words I can't write. Like I can write them but I get them all wrong and I mix them all up um, and I do it so often that it, it's just not normal <laughs> <laughs> like the, the lives that I did on YouTube and this was live to an audience I didn't even know who was watching I probably made um, a mistake each session on my spelling and one of the words was doesn't I couldn't write it <laughs> okay yeah I have to go through it in my head <laughs> yeah I couldn't write I wrote it and I was like that's wrong and then like, I, was, I wrote it again, I was like, that's not right. And then I had to look it up on Google. Yep. Um, so I really struggle with um, writing certain words sometimes. And if I don't have a spell checker, that's it, I'm done. But, but the great thing about phones now is you can, because I can't physically know how to, how to spell it out sometimes to the point where it won't even, spell checker won't pick it up. Yeah. But what I love about um, uh, Android phones is you can ask Google. You can say the word and it'll spell it out for you. And I'm like, that's brilliant. When I work with dyslexic students, I say, look, if you're writing an essay, speak it to the computer. Because if you speak it to the computer and you can write it at the same time, you can't get out of writing, you write it and speak it, then they have a version of it. Um, and loads of dyslexic students who write essays now do it via voice activation. 
uh, just because it's easier it helps us to think our ideas out necessarily write them how does that happen during exams though if you so if you have a, a learning diagnosis you can get i did it for my university um oh, so dys dyslexia as well pardon you can get a computer based exam for dyslexia you can do in university you can do if you push quite hard for it um for other subjects for gcse a levels yeah it is possible but i thought they just gave extra time or it's usual um it depends on the level um for certain like i i used to scribe for somebody who was dyslexic um because their writing was their writing was so poor that they would have been disadvantaged it has to be there's an argument on whether it's disadvantaging somebody yeah. um, and most people therefore get extra time because of of checking it kind of depends on how it affects you and it depends on what your diagnosis says and it depends on all sorts of things so my diagnosis i wasn't diagnosed till i was at university but my diagnosis for university um recommended that i used voice activated software when i spoke my exams so when i did my exams i did them on my own i did them on a computer and i spoke them um and that was something that the psychologist had recommended because that was a way that 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 I worked and, and the way that I found it useful. Did you find that later on in life that your essay writing has improved and you are able to now write stuff or is it or is that I am better yeah I'm better and, and I teach now dyslexic students um, with kind of coping strategies and stuff but I I still wouldn't say it's easy mm. um, but I have techniques to be able to write out for example the student I've just been teaching as, as well as is doing essay writing and um, I always start you know for the, the introduction the introduction has a what a where a why a when and a how and if I can go through all those things in the introduction then I've got some information down and I know how to write it and I'm I'm incredibly thankful that um, I might do my undergrad at Oxford and my tutors at Oxford picked up on um on on my learning disability and they were the ones who pushed me to go and get diagnosed they were the ones who helped me to learn how to write essays hmm. so. i remember when i was doing my gcse english coursework i used to get d's and e's and my english teacher used to make me rewrite and redo she'd give me a different topic so i couldn't even just rewrite the same one um to the point where i managed to get and i got a at the end because she made me rewrite the essay so many times and redraft to the and, and then remarked it <laughs> and i think if you've got the teachers that will push you you can do well but but then at the same time i knew that i wasn't I, there was no way i deserved it <laughs> well i think there's a different there's a difference i suppose between guiding and and then interfering but i i do think a large amount of guidance does have to happen and i and i think you know with with some of the students that i get there's there, there is a fine line between guiding and, and I'm doing it for them. yeah <laughs> that one <laughs> yeah it wasn't until i think because when you do your teaching degree you have to write essays yeah and that was the first time that i felt comfortable writing stuff oh, i still so hated it i still right? hated it i still hated it when i didn't, <laughs> went back and did my pgc i hated it i still I hated spent... it like i would still leave it last minute because i would try and oh, avoid the opposite. it as as possible <laughs> But um, you, I'd have to do it, and then and then it would kind of pour out because I knew that I'd only got like five hours left. <laughs> wow! No, I can't do that. I I I was the opposite when I did my teaching degree. I spent I spent weeks over Christmas. I remember writing one specific essay, books everywhere, all research. There's different ways of doing it. <laughs> I think I can sit there weeks in advance, and nothing will go on paper. I'll put a sentence, and that'll be it. And I'll be like, okay, what's next? And I just can't think. And then when the deadline's looming, I'm like, okay. <laughs> pressure. <laughs> the pressure works. Yeah. yeah, I work with pressure. So my final essay, I left it so fine. I stayed awake all night and it was done half an hour before I had to go into work and submit it. Wow. That was fine. I've never Yeah, that it. is fine. <laughs> yeah. That was my last one. So that could could have I could have failed. <laughs> I did one of my one of my PGC essays I did on the plane to Dubai because I was teaching I was tutoring out there. Um, you were tutoring while you were 
while you were training <laughs> yeah I tutored whilst I trained um and I was going to visit a student out there and I remember someone looking over and being like what are you doing I went, I'm writing a I'm writing a however many word essay on uh the treatment of dyslexia throughout throughout school life <laughs> I was like, here I am with my laptop. <laughs> Got to get it done. <laughs> get it wherever. <laughs> yeah. But then I'm going to tutor a student in Dubai at the same time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so did they, did you still train in a school? Or were you able to use some of your, some of your residential uh, no. tutoring? No. 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 So my, I did my PGC um, three years ago I think two or three years ago now um and I went back to Oxford to do it so I did it with them and as part of that you have to go into two schools um so my first school was a school that is failing or um also not as I think requires improvement uh the second was very much a school that suited me it had its own on-site farm and everything Oh, wow. <laughs> you know that was a me school um, but there were two very different schools uh two very different uh populations of of students that went there um and two very different styles of teaching so it was really great to see especially and i think i think it's helped with my tuition as well mm. because it it's helped me to see the different ways of teaching and i think just the idea for me of of really getting the idea of different pedagogy and, and being able to see okay this is yeah. this is why we do it this way has helped me to become a better teacher and also, um, when just... you, sorry i was gonna say when you've been to grammar schools like you have and i have as well we have one kind of idea yeah. of the education systems like and it's very different when you're in a state school very different yeah i i, I don't think i'd really considered that until i stepped in there the first day of my teaching degree um I'd obviously I'd been to visit schools because you have to 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 apply, but I don't think I'd really considered the difference in teaching and the difference that needed to happen in teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe I I I mean I came from quite a in terms of education quite a closeted background, and I was very lucky because everybody, most people who who were in grammar school wanted to do very well, and and they had very high ambitions, and they didn't have the distractions that some of the students at my first school had and they didn't have some of the life situations that they had yeah. and that idea of just turning around and going wait a minute there is more here than going on than just i i really I, it's, it's something that annoys me now when people say <laughs> oh bless you <laughs> <laughs> i was trying to keep it dead i was like oh. <laughs> <laughs> but when people when people say you know oh you know those those kids they're acting up or they're you know they're being naughty on purpose a large amount of the time they're not a large amount of the time something's happened and and there's a reason that they're acting that yeah. way and the the idea i work a lot with teens and so when people say to me it, it really gets annoyed, annoyed when people are like oh teenagers these days they you know they don't care they're lazy they're not they they really do care you just have to get them on the right thing and you just have to engage them and you have to not patronize them because ultimately these are young adults and, and these are the people who we want to engage we want to stretch and so that's something that i think it definitely taught me going into schools is that teens teens are my thing and for me teenagers are the best students to teach i love teaching teenagers um most people don't but but for me <laughs> I, I love it i think they're great so um i had a similar experience so i i didn't do the pgc route i did um uh school direct okay because I'd been teaching um, unqualified prior to doing my um, my teaching degree. Uh, so I'd, I'd had college experience teaching in a private college. And it was great because I taught a lot of international kids and a lot of them from, from China and they were learning English. And we used to have um, amazing lessons because they could, they'd read a text of maths and, and they wouldn't be able to answer the question because they didn't understand the language that was being used. Yeah. So I remember one question, it was a statistics question and I, and I wrote it on the board and I was like, okay, we're looking at the pulse rate um, and these are all the pulse rates. And they just looked at me and I was like, do you know what pulse rate is? 
and they just looked at me and I was like, grab your fingers, <laughs> pulse. <And> like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> so I had to come up with creative ways of teaching them and I loved it. It, it, it kind of, because I did art and textiles and then uh, physics and maths at A-level. That's cool. I had that creative side and to be able to merge the two together. So I used to make mind maps for them and use color and, and do all sorts of crazy craft stuff with them just to get them to visualize what was being said on paper. Cause I taught them physics and maths. Um, but I loved it there. So I went from there to then doing, um, a school direct. And that was through the King Edward consortium in Birmingham. And it's meant to be one of the top training providers in the, in the UK. Um, but again, it's, it's a very tight niche. They only take 30, 30 students, uh, 30 students, teach students, yeah. teacher, teacher training, teacher training, student teachers, student teachers. That's, it. that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they've got like a consortium of schools that they work with, but the first school that they put me in was, um, a state school. And again, it was really eye opening because the way that they grade each student, like it was a target grade, mm -hmm. the way that they have such strict rules, like you can't even take your blazer off or, yeah. or even like move to, or even like turn around. And they, 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 it's like so closely monitored everything. They don't want the kids to go out of, it's very kind of uh, regimented. And I found that really shocking. I was just like, yeah, just let them be kids. <laughs> yeah. um, so I went from there, that was my first placement. And my second placement was a grammar school um and it was a mixed grammar school so i'd been to a girls school and that was very different mm -hmm. and see the dynamics between the kids and, and because i looked really young um like a lot of the lads would uh would kind of try and intimidate you and i'm like yeah <laughs> <laughs> they like stand up and they'd be taller than me and i'm like yeah <laughs> i mean i'm i'm quite sure and i had i had year eight girls when I was in my first school who, yeah. who would, yeah they would be taller than me and they would they were kind of you know young female let's kind of see how far we can push her and, and uh female you know. students don't like female teachers <laughs> I had this experience when I was at grammar school if we had a substitute female teacher it was horrible they used to make them cry yeah and we had one um, cover teacher for a year and she was a nun. Well, she used to be a nun and she left that because um, I, I think she's had some health issues. So they, they were like, oh, you have to be working a certain number of days and she couldn't keep up with it. So she left and she became a teacher, well, a cover teacher. And she was so nice. And yet the students in my class made her cry. Yeah. I mean, in, in my grammar school, we made state teachers that. cry. I remember that. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't think I could work in a girls' school. <laughs> don't think I could. I worked in a boys' school. <laughs> I don't think I could work in a girls' school. I don't think I could work in a school. I think that was what I decided after after doing my PGC. After your PGC, yeah. did you not do your NQT then? I didn't do my NQT. No. Wow. It's uh, it's something I I still could choose to do, but I I'm I'm. There have been points where I thought about going back to do it, um, but no, I never did my NQT year. I do. You couldn't have made your decision and you stuck with it. Yeah, I was I was lucky in that. So I I went to Dubai um, to do, I think, about three months of, of private tutoring just before I started my PGCE. So when I started it, the decision was there to either become a full-time tutor or to go into teaching. And then throughout my PGC, I did a bit of tutoring at the same time. Um, and when I came out of my um, PGC, I had uh, work booked, international work booked for summer and then also for Christmas. Um, and so I knew that I wasn't going to be able to start my NQT year and then be able to have the amount of work that I needed off to be able to do the tutoring. So I actually delayed it until January. And then in January, I turned around and went, no, I don't think I'm going to do it. <laughs> so, If you can find a job that's taking you across the entire world, I don't think you'd want to be stuck in four walls in a classroom. <laughs> yeah, I, I find it more interesting as well to work one-on-one. -on -one. Like, I, I loved some of the classes that I had, and I loved the classroom dynamic, and I loved the idea of, 
you know, t teaching multiple kids at the same time. But most of what I do now is one on one. Um, and I, I really do enjoy that. I, I think I enjoy the group work a lot better. And I think it was really interesting because I used to hate um, practical work. I don't know how you were at school, but I hated doing experiments. I was a student that would sit at the back, watch everyone else do it and write the results. And I'd be like, you do it, I'm gonna watch. Or I'd say to the teacher, can you just give us the results? Just tell us what we're meant to be writing in the exam. Now you run <laughs> group practical kind of things. It's like... <laughs> yeah, group practical, I never used to touch any of the equipment. So when I went to uni, I did theoretical physics. So I didn't have to do any practical work. Um, and the first year, all the theory students, all the theoretical physics students had to do six weeks of lab work. It was awful. We just sat there going, how do you switch the sun? How, well, <laughs> do you do this bit? I don't know how to do this bit. Do you want to do that bit? And we had to use all this equipment, electrical equipment, all this stuff, and we didn't know how to do it. And we hated it. We didn't want to be there. But we had to do it to be able to get a physics degree. That was their way of making you do physics experiments. <laughs> that was the only lab work I did at uni. So how did it differ with yours? How much lab work did you have? Um, from my first year, it was a day a week. Um, so every Friday we would troop into labs. Um, that would be the day. And then for my master's, your master's is almost entirely, there's, I, I can't remember the percentages now, but I think it's about 70% of it is project based. Wow. So um, in Oxford, you do three years as your undergrad um and your lab work isn't graded but it's part of the course you have to do it and then all scientists at oxford go on to uh kind of it's called an intercalated masters so you go on to your fourth year um without reapplying and that fourth year is basically practical so you work in a lab i worked in a lab i think for a six to nine months uh doing my part two project and then i did two three sorry courses alongside it which I then took exams in at the end. So, yeah. So what subject was it that you took at uni? So I did biochemistry. There's a huge title. Show it to me. <laughs> Do you have a spider catcher in your house? <laughs> I've got two jars already on top of spiders I caught. So I don't, I don't think I've got a second. Oh my God, it's massive. Have you got a jar? So, okay. Um, yeah, so, so what was I talking about? Biochemistry, I can't remember. Oh, you did biochemistry at I did biochemistry at university, yeah. So biochem for the first three years, which was like my undergrad, my fourth year you you slightly specialize mm -hmm. in oxford you don't have any choice until you get to your fourth year you all cover the exact same stuff in biochemistry okay. yeah it's, it's quite an unusual course um everyone takes the exact same modules there's no choice until you get to your last year and then for my last year my project was on human genetics and my kind of options i did an option in pharmacology i did one in virology um, so a lot of the people who are currently on the radio, I had lectures with, which is quite fun, um, <laughs> because quite a lot of the Oxford Oxford virologists are um, are doing are doing quite a lot of the vaccine work. And actually, one of my tutors is is doing it, so <laughs> that's quite fun. Um, so he's been on like Sky News and stuff, so that's always quite fun. I know that person. Yeah, and and we all message him like Max, this is great. We love what you're doing. <laughs> so uh yeah so virology was one of my last ones as well like, that's like our claim to fame right we, we know someone we know a famous scientist yeah yeah <laughs> i get excited that i did a summer project at um the gravitational waves department at birmingham uni and a couple of years ago they were working with one of the universities in america and they jointly found the gravitational waves in space so my claim to fame is i worked in that department i contributed <laughs> I feel like I probably didn't contribute towards no. my tutor's work, but <laughs> yeah, but it's just nice to say that I did do some stuff. I did a bit of coding yeah. on the side, like <laughs> yeah. I I was I was so happy like when my so <clears throat> my tutor Max Crispin works. Um, he works in virology. He worked for years and years and years on HIV. 
so when I was working with him like when I was being tutored by him he was working on HIV and he kind of like HIV is a really hard field to work in because mm. just there's, there's so much of it and also so little works mm. and he used to it, it, he used to come in and, and I think this is the kind of odd thing about a about an Oxford education is is he would he would come into tutorials there'd only be two of you there and if you arrived early or like me because I had I was diagnosed with dyslexia I had one-on-one -on -one tutorials with him uh which were on essay writing and he'd just tell me some of the stuff that he did and I was like this is fun you know I get to find out a little bit about the sugars that surround HIV and now he's doing a similar thing comparing the sugars on a coronavirus against HIV so uh so a lot of those models have have come up and I was like this is amazing you know this is this is the kind of pinnacle that people work for and yeah they still think it's exciting I still I still do get excited by science how come you didn't do a PhD then if you were that excited on your fourth year then wouldn't it have been natural to then continue I didn't enjoy my project in fourth year <laughs> so and and I didn't find anything out in my project either mm. um so there was that there was I took a year out in university um between just before my third year exams i a week before decided that i was going to take a year out i was going to rusticate for a year um i'd i'd been diagnosed as dyslexic at the in the start of my second year end of first start of second and oxford terms are really tight so they're only eight weeks and i really struggled to the idea of biochemistry is purely essay based Mm. Uh, and I couldn't write an essay <laughs> so I really struggled with the idea of how to learn to write an essay at the same time as keeping up with all the work and I didn't I, I felt behind uh, in hindsight I should have I should have taken the year out earlier and I didn't I didn't look after myself um, I didn't believe I could do it so I had a lot of self-doubt once I was diagnosed I um, became a bit of a self-sabotager um, and ultimately it reached it reached kind of breaking point a week before my exams when I just looked at it and went I can't do this mm. um, I don't actually know a load of the stuff that I'm doing I spoke to my tutor about it the one that's now doing the coronavirus stuff um, and he was like he, he said you can go in and you can try it and also I was using all this new software for, for writing essays. And I was like, there's a lot of it. Um, he was like, you can go in and try it. And if it doesn't work, then you, as long as you don't take the last exam, then you don't score for it. So that year doesn't, doesn't count. And they'll allow you to do what's called stepping down, which is just dropping up for a year. Or you can leave now. And I thought it was better for my mental health to leave then. So I took that year out. And it was probably in that year out that I realised that doing a PhD on top of what had become a five-year degree was probably not for me. Yeah. Um, I would love to do a PhD, but the area that I want to do it in is I, I'd, I'd really like to look at the um, neural pathways in the brain of people who have um, autism and Asperger's. But cool. to do that, you need to have the brain really well mapped and it's not <laughs> so i talked to a couple of people about it um and they they ultimately said if you were to do it you wouldn't get the answers that you want out of it because we don't know enough so maybe it's something i do when i'm old i don't know uh i can go back maybe i can go back at, at 60 and do it as a retirement thing uh a retirement about, phd what about doing um a master's in education on, on the autism spectrum, like the autistic yeah. spectrum, that, that's the other way of looking at it on a more um, non-sciencey way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and again, there's nothing that I, I suppose I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no to it. Um, at the moment, focusing on on kind of business and, and that kind of side yeah. is something that's going to take, and takes a large amount of my time. But yeah, it's not something I'd say no to. And it, yeah, I think this is where we differ because when I was at uni, I was like, "That's it, I can't do it anymore." <laughs> so, I said that. I said that, and then I went back to do the do the PGCE. So I was like, "I'm never going back ever." It's different though, right? Yeah, it's, different. it's not the same as 
Yeah, it's sort of the same as doing a, a science degree at uni, which is really intense. It's, it's a different sort of um, degree to do. Different pressure. Yeah, it is. And I think um, I'd had enough by the four, because I did four years. Yeah. Um, for They call it slightly different in, at Birmingham Uni. It's four years undergrad, master's, undergrad yeah. master's, so it's MSI. Um, so I did that and I got to the end and I was like, this is it. I don't understand what's going on. I've just regurgitated stuff that I've learned. <laughs> so I don't actually understand what's going on there. Um, I could never go back and do a PhD. But interestingly, my my final, because we did like a, a mini sort of project, our final kind of for our, for our teaching degree, well, our fifth coursework was like a mini project because I did um, the extra credit. So if I did do a master's, I just got to do a bit more. Okay. Uh, make it into a master's. That's cool. Cause I've got a PG dip head, so I just need to do a bit more, but I don't think I, I'd go back and do that. Though. <laughs> um, but that, that project was on Asperger's syndrome. All oh, right. Okay. Um, yeah. So I was um, shadowing um, one child in particular and seeing how he interacted in different lessons. And it, it was really fascinating. And then I, I could work with him and, and try out different things and see what, he, what worked. And, um, and I think that's what I love when it comes to tutoring is, is picking out those kids that haven't yet been diagnosed. Like I can pick them out and, the, and cause you see the certain traits and sometimes the parents have noticed the traits within them, but they don't know what it is. Um, and being able to go, Oh, this person's high functioning and maybe they are on the spectrum. So maybe tr uh, getting them diagnosed might actually help you kind of support them in the learning. But it's, um, I find I that the support, the support thing's an interesting one because I, I sometimes see teens who are wary about telling people yeah uh, so either because they've been bullied or because they've been recently diagnosed and I know how it was really worrying for me to tell people like yeah. I I felt when I got diagnosed how can I be at Oxford if I'm dyslexic yeah like, those two things shouldn't be together um, it's ridiculous now when you say it but but i remember that i remember that feeling kind of label, isn't it it's a stigma with having a label put on you which kind of says you're yeah. not you're not normal and you're like well like, as a kid that's it's kind of scary yeah yeah and i and i i found it as an adult scary um yeah. i looked at everything that i did differently um and it took me it it probably took me God, two years to realize that actually just having a label for something didn't make a difference and it, it took me it took me such a long time and it took again my tutors it took max especially my tutor to turn around and be like you're exactly the same as you were nothing has changed because my confidence for writing essays just disappeared so before i may not have been able to write great essays but at least i tried mm. and then afterwards i just didn't try I just kind of bashed something out and thought, no, I'm no, no good at it anyway, so I'm never going to be able to do it. Whereas now when I take on, I, I specifically take on students who are dyslexic, um, that's one of the big things I say to them is that, you know, a label doesn't make a difference. You're still, You can still do things brilliantly. Just because you're dyslexic doesn't mean that you, you know, can't spell or you can't read or you can't. Different people have different parts of a diagnosis. And I, I think a lot of parents fear that as well. Some parents fear that a label will be put on their child and it's going gonna, it's gonna to stick with them and how are people going to react. But it, it's a way of getting that support and the network and people to understand that you need things to be done slightly differently for you and for people to take notice of that. Because otherwise, they, they won't. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think schools don't make a good job of creating an atmosphere where it's almost celebrated and accepted that you are different and it's fine. They, they don't do that. And I think I realized that when I was working in schools and one of the, the key things that I do in the workshops that I, I run is to celebrate the differences in everyone and not to make it like a big thing, but just for kids to accept others for who they are and it not being a big issue. So yeah. I deliberately have mixed age abilities. I have five to 14 in the class. People are like, how on earth do you do that? But because when you have a mixed age ability, it's not about competing anymore. It's about collaborative work and people recognize, the kids recognize that they're all at different starting points. They recognize they have different strengths. Um, we have SEN kids. We have kids that are high functioning. We have, we have like the broad spectrum, but because they're not competing, it's not an issue anymore. They support each other. They'll, and I, I like that atmosphere. So yeah, I, and I, I suppose how, 
how do kids who come from because i know that you deal with some homeschoolers but i assume also some schooled children so how do they do you see a difference in those that are schooled versus those that are homeschooled we do on, on weekends we'd have a mixed group where we have some homeschoolers and we have some school kids mm. and it's interesting how the homeschool kids are far more open to try out new things to be creative to kind of just accept people and ask questions and all this and then school kids are kind of they think I don't know there, there's a difference in the way that they tackle work and the way that they interact with the other kids um and then after a few weeks they they start to all merge and it's the same and they will yeah kind of... but at the start is something that you, you can do, notice have you noticed that because I know you work with a couple of yeah I've got I've got a number of homeschoolers I've got some though that so some of mine are choice homeschoolers and some of mine are homeschoolers due to other reasons um so those that are homeschooled I get quite a lot of girls who have uh, had to leave school due to mental health issues usually um who may be going back in so they kind of sit in their own little pot um but those that are choice homeschoolers yeah those that are choice homeschoolers are really interesting because they might take a topic that's just it might not be on the curriculum or it might be at a completely different level than what their age says. And they go, I want to do that. <laughs> and you go, okay, perfect. Let's do that. <laughs> the difference is you're working one-on-one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm working in a group, but we do have some kids that I, I remember doing um, a workshop in a library once and it, it was on a weekend, but we happened to have some homeschoolers in there. And this one kid, he he answered a question. We were looking at NASA. We were looking at, um, um, it was last year, we were looking at the moon landing and all the inventions that came out of that. We were explaining some of the science behind some of the inventions. And he started explaining this topic that I know I learned at uni. And I said to his mum after, I was like, where has he learned that from? And she goes, oh, he watches lectures on YouTube and TV. Yeah. And I'm like, it, it, he was only six. <laughs> sometimes you look at them and sometimes I'm like where did you come up with that I had a student two weeks ago and we were doing we were doing some scholarship stuff and and already he's beyond where he needs to be but we were doing it was a great question someone gave it to me someone on a on a group somewhere on Facebook and it was uh how fast does no what's the mass of a meteor that was traveling at I think 11.7 meters per second or 11.7 something, might mean kilometers per second. Um, what's the mass of the meteor in order to vaporize all the water on Earth? Great question. It was such a cool question. Um, and I said this 11.7, and he went, oh, that's greater than the, uh, than the speed that you need to be to be pulled into the... And I was like, what are you talking about? I have no idea. What you're... And I Googled it, and he was right. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. you know more than I do that's fine <laughs> but I think that's what it is when you're homeschooling you're 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 facilitating the learning you don't necessarily have to know more than them you just have to be able to guide them in the right direction and be able to yeah them. but um yeah I, I love working with uh, homeschool kids yeah it's amazing I mean it's I think nice. you work at a higher level I don't I don't think I could do that I work at a lower level with homeschoolers <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I work with I work with some that are they come to me because they're high learning potential. Mm. So I get um, and and the agency gets as well students who are years ahead. So that's our one of one of kind of my areas is kids that don't necessarily fit in their age bracket at school. Um, and then they end up coming to us because they need a bit of stretch. They need a bit of challenge mm. or they're homeschooling and <clears throat> they, you know, they're, they're beyond the point, but they're still interested mm. and it's about feeding off that interest. So yeah, I have, I have a, <laughs> I have a, um, again, 10 year old who's doing, we've been doing like expansion of the universe theories and we've been doing alternatives to the big bang and he's currently writing a paper on relativity and it's like you go for it you know <laughs> you go for it you keep going i'm gonna help as much as i can uh, especially as my area is not physics you know my yeah. area is biochemistry 
So we've also been doing mutations in DNA and how mutations can turn into cancer and, and different kind of areas on that. Um, but sometimes you do realize, oh yeah, he is actually only 10. Um, sometimes you can forget that, especially doing online. It's, uh, yeah, that I think um, one parent asked me whether I could tutor her 10 year old at degree level and I was like I don't think I can <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I can so never do degree yeah he's working with um, a tutor now that's tutoring him at degree level but I'm working with the younger daughter who's five. Oh, yes I've heard about her yeah so um it's amazing because she's just I'm just like how are you doing that like I'm just <laughs> you that just now how are you doing that um but she isn't homeschooled she's she goes to school yeah. Her, her mum is saying that they don't recognise her potential at school. She's quiet at school and she doesn't interact at school. Yeah. Um, but, oh my God, it's so amazing. You just see them and you're like, you're so tiny. Yeah, HLP, HLP kids are, are like, just, just, they confuse me and they excite me at the same time because it's like, wow. <laughs> it's I give just... her a problem and she's like, yeah, you did this and you did it. I'm like, hang on a second, let me just have a look at that again. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's great. Them it's amazing and she's only she's only five and she's we've already done algebra and um to quite a high level and i'm like oh yeah. this is a bit working <laughs> i've got i've got a tutor who goes in to see i think he must be six and they do chess and they do maths and and he's always like yeah he's better than me at chess <laughs> so, but but you know they're interested as long as they're interested yeah then that's perfect you know i i will always have time for somebody if they are interested in something i always take the time to try and explain it to them i think this makes us uh, move nicely into um talking about um lockdown and kind of things that people could do so let's focus yeah. on um maybe our focus should have been like high functioning science <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. off topic but it's, it's a good topic though i think it's a really good topic to discuss because um I've got a couple of parents that are struggling at the moment with their high functioning kids. And it's just like, how do we keep them entertained? We don't have enough books in the house. Um, we don't have enough resources to keep them busy. Like what do we do with them? And I think it's really difficult. So um, based on your experience, what would be your tips on engaging kids within the sphere of science and it's vast um, at home, especially those that are high, high functioning. I know I've put you on the spot here. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. Um, projects <laughs> like a large amount of what I do is project-based learning um so even when I teach even when I teach residential I theme all my work so every day has a theme um and the maths questions will be to do with the theme and the science will be to do with the theme and, and we'll try and work everything in um as much as possible <clears throat> so we end up with that so much work for you no, because all you do is you change some of the words in the math. You still do the stuff that you plan to do. But I did like, I uh, remember my, one of my first ever residentials was to Turkey. And I thought it was going to be really hard to do this theming. But I presented the, the client family based on this theme. So I was like, well, we're going to do a theme a day. And I was like, oh no, what did I do? You know, I, I did it wrong. Um, but all I realized that was I had to go through and the night before or even even just you know a little bit of time before and I just had to change some of the words mm. so if I was doing ratios I put them in a baking day or if I was doing scale I, I used scale for our turkey day um, and we, we talked about how long this bridge was or how tall this building was and and all of that just just required a little bit of working around we did some numeracy stuff we always do the numeracy base but then i just made the word problems that uh, you know, based on that so that would be my thing for for doing it at home is try and try and theme but also try and do projects so when i was i remember when like when i was at home my parents my parents didn't go to university my parents left school at 14 and 16 um but a lot of what they did for me was to expose me to different ideas and different things and and, and also different tutors um mm. who could open open my mind so one of them that i had really influential tutor for me peter um he he said to me one day we were talking about kind of how to 
how to keep interest and how to keep busy over summer and he was like well just do a project I was mm. like but what project he was like find something you're interested in you know um for example we always say that you know plants grow best at x temperature is sit on the back of plants do they really grow at that temperature or are there other temperatures that they grow at better or um the the kind of celery and and celery in different colored waters type experiment mm. well you can take that further and you can go well, what if you punch holes in each of the xylem does it still work does it stop you know do they bleed different colors yeah, why is it that what's, what's the xylem oh <laughs> the xylem carries the water up and down um the sorry up the plant doesn't go down um from the roots to the to the leaf so <laughs> If you're doing a, there's a celery type experiment where you put the celery in different colors oh and, it, and colored and water it with flowers as well and it and yeah yeah and it, so i i tend to do it with celery because it shows in the leaves but it will show in the flowers as well but if you in celery it's the stringy bits that are their xylem and phloem so you can like poke holes in them mm-hmm. and you can see well if i poke a hole in it does that stop all of the water going up because that should be because i've damaged the xylem and see does the color really go up or you know what how dark can i get it to go i've seen some really amazing um homemade indicators that people have done we've done done some with red cabbage red cabbage yeah red cabbage purple so it confuses me every time (laughs) Um, but you can make yeah, great. Red cabbage. Yeah, we used to do loads of acid and alkali experiments with red cabbage, and it's so yeah. easy to make as well. Um, I think those kind of things. There's DNA extraction you can do from strawberries or like the inside of your cheek. That's quite fun because you can see it. Um, there's a lot of kind of home science, and then I think if we were going to go further to to somebody who is more HLP, who is a higher level. It's about taking some of those principles and coming up with something to test them. Mm. So often my students who are HRP, they understand the theory, but they can't necessarily put it into a practical. And also a lot of us haven't, because by the time you get to something like A-level, there are set practicals in school and a large amount of them are boring. So but this is why you know, I loved because I, I, I did advancing physics at A level. Okay. They don't do that anymore now. But with advancing physics, you get you do 12 experiments. And I think six of them you decide what you do. That's perfect. And yeah. one of them, one was um Hooke's law. I think it was Hooke's law. You know, no, no, Young's modulus. Young's okay. modulus. So it's looking at the stretching of materials and how they kind of how, the, how strong the materials are. And um I, I linked it with my textiles. So I oh, looked at 12 nice. weaves of denim and the different, so denim weave and I looked at a normal weave and I looked at how much weights I could hang off and stretch each material. And it is denim actually stronger than yeah. the others because yeah. uh, it's used in workwear. And I found that so fascinating because I was like, I'm putting my textiles knowledge into a context, but they don't do that kind of stuff anymore. No, there are set experiments mm-hmm. and that's something that you you know we we don't break out of enough and this is a perfect time to do so Mm. um so i've got uh again it's a student who it's not a student i teach but a student that one of my tutors teaches um has been working on she's doing a project about food it's overall it's the history of food Mm. but she's looking she's looking at different aspects from different subjects and the science part is a heston blumenthal style um kind of module that we're designing and 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 that my tutors worked on with her which is food that looks like something but tastes like something else so she did um she did a rubik style cake where each of the cubes taste different um <laughs> and the colors were different to what they tasted of um and then i think she did she did a cake that looked like ramen and it was about so like go back to that rubik <laughs> Okay, I'm just, I'm just trying to. Like, I need to go back to the xylem question. But let me go back to that first. What's the answer to that? So I don't know. Stops? Oh, you I don't know. No, I've said it for one of my students this week. Okay. <laughs> You're gonna have to share with me the results because I'm yeah. curious. Now. They'll send me a photo through. So but with the with the Rubik's cube one. So if if something is say purple, but it tastes of orange, yeah, flavor, 
it's looking at whether your eyes do the tasting or whether your what brain I was does the say. tasting. When you eat it, do you just get confused with the orange flavour taste because you're seeing the purple? That, do you that was her project. Different? That was her project. So it was about whether, so we linked it then to a piece on whether you're, like what is your primary sense? Mm. So and she's, she's a student, she is 11 or 12 um so we're taking it kind of from that level um was the idea is you know do your eyes see more or do you taste more and obviously when you when you get rid of the sight you're not confused so the the sight is what's confusing you and it's looking at whether our sight is our primary sense so that was quite an interesting i guess there's two senses working together your nose and yeah whether you're a factory is doing doing that as well so smell the orange before you're going to taste it so confusing but, but though. If you close one then you're not really going to taste anything so. well no and that's that's an interesting one is when you close when you block off your nose and you taste stuff whether it tastes different um and then you can get from amazon you can get these taste changing tablets i don't know if you've ever come across them no we've done taste tests so we did a whole topic on senses with the kids and oh my and the amount of stuff i learned i was like we never taught any of this at school because i had to do all the research and we presented <laughs> it to the kids and we did experiments with it um but it's fascinating that you're you're not just smelling through your nostrils you smell from the back of your neck yeah um, <laughs> and the, like the amount of senses you've got in your nose and the olfactory like bulb and oh it was amazing you it's need amazing. to get hold of these tablets these tablets are, are interesting if you eat the tablet and then you eat a lemon it tastes sweet I did come across, there's a plant that does that. There is a plant, yeah. These are like a concentrated version, I think. Uh, yeah, so we came across the plant and we were talking about, yeah, it was, every time you chew the plant, yeah, this is what we were trying to figure out. If you chew it again, does it go back to what it tasted like? <laughs> I don't think so. And that if you have these tablets, because I only know it in terms of the tablets, the tablet wears off at some point. But it'd be so, interesting to know once you like, chew one of the plants and, they, and everything changes and do you chew it again and everything changes back to what it was. I think it might just prolong the, prolong the effect, would it not? Because it's a chemical. It's a chemical, I think. That's released. So again, if you're looking at, if you've got a student who is further on, looking at that chemical is perfect. Mm. So from a biochemistry point of view, can you look at that chemical and can you work out is there somewhere on the internet or can you work out what it might be turned into mm. that would make it sweet or you know can you look at how it's made in the plant and maybe it's it's and you can do so many different things but you know and i look at this chemical and, and we can say okay well if you add it to certain foods like if you grind it up and you added it to soup does that make soup taste different or is there a certain amount of tablet that you have to add before it has the desired effect you know the, does temperature change it does putting it in an acidic food work better because they work really well with lemons apparently than putting it in a, a slightly alkaline food or you know there's there's a lot of different avenues that you can go down and the the kind of with science i get quite excited about these ideas because i think that there's so much possibility yeah and, and that's I, that's the fun thing for me and i think this is why over the last 10 years we hardly ever repeat anything because there's so much more to like there's another thing to do another thing yeah. to explore that i never really go back to what we've done because there's so much more and even if you go back to an experiment you can do it differently yeah and it'll, it's a completely different experiment and it's endless possibilities that you've got got out there I think that's why I keep emailing like, oh, release those resources because uh, <laughs> together because there's so much overlap in what we do. <laughs> I think there's a lot of like, there's a lot of stuff that I probably do for the first time that I often when I do things like I know that I've done, um, I've seen it recently, I've seen that you've done teeth as, mm -hmm. as a workshop at, at some point. And I know that with my homeschoolers, we've done teeth. Mm -hmm. um, but we probably haven't done the same things. No. We've probably done completely different things. Like we looked at, um, I was lucky he one of my homeschoolers happened to have a deer's tooth so we looked at like how the tooth looked different they'd found it and we looked at how it looked different to different animals teeth and we used um, some some disclosing tablets and different things like that <laughs> well you're coming from an outdoor angle yeah uh, from a very kind of biology kind of um chemistry perspective 
I'm coming from a creative angle and yeah. a physics perspective. So when we looked at teeth, they made teeth. Yeah, which is not what we did. <laughs> we made braces, and we looked at, and then we looked at like how braces work and all of this kind of stuff. So it's a completely different angle. And we had all this. We looked at the wire because again, physics materials. We looked at how this wire, when you put it into um, boiling water, it changes shape, and how um, how NASA is using that. Yeah, <laughs> all of this kind of stuff, and it, it's a completely different angle because we're coming from different angles. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like stuff that I wouldn't have thought of. But yeah, having thought about it now, that makes total sense. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. I think there's so much you can do um, with one topic and then you're bringing in your own experience and your own angle. And then when you've got kids in the room and they've done some research on it, they bring their own angle into it um, with so many different things. Definitely, I think I need to get my resources together so you can utilise them and... and um, but it's just, it's, to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm an admin person though. So uh, yeah, <laughs> everything kind of gets put into folders and not labeled properly. And then I can never find anything if I look back. Yeah, um, I've just got boxes, boxes of stuff and an overflowing bookshelf that kind of sits oh, yeah. over there. I've got that too. Um, and I'm thinking, do I chuck this away? And I'm like, but they all bring worksheets. Yeah. But I'm never going to use them again because they're like seven years old and I look at them and I cringe and I'm like oh that was so badly done um and I do things differently now but I'm like I can't throw them away because no. they might come in handy <laughs> I have I have old textbooks that the schools that I was working in were throwing out and I was like you can't throw them I'm gonna take them home and I still have them and I you still know. occasionally go through them I you do like yeah, like me yeah yeah especially for academic stuff not for anything else but if it's academic i'm having it oh i kind of hoard everything because i'm like i've got like right in front of me there i've got like 10 um egg boxes because i'm like they might come in handy for a, a craft-based science activity that we do i got three cardboard boxes to the side of me okay, because of that yeah i might use that i might use this i might use that and i yeah. and um i've got a storage space now and it is filled to the rim with science stuff and because I can't find anything in it I end up going and getting the same thing again because I don't have the patience to find it so then I have multiples of the same thing um and I don't have an inventory so my staff don't know what <laughs> you need to sort that out maybe that's a that's a now project <laughs> it's, uh... well, it's not at home it's like in a different uh... location and uh I don't really want them to be going out right now so <laughs> yeah <fair. laughs> um okay so we went like, that was uh, your kind of um tip number one yeah that's Which that's a, a project work. about yep and uh, what was tip number two tip number two for it kind of goes along with the project stuff but what i am saying and it's not science i suppose specifically but i am it kind of comes into your stuff as well actually is i'm a big fan of a of a record log so for me i work with a lot of uh, as, as you know i work with hlp students i work with students who are looking to go to top unis or, or top schools and i say to parents is you know don't don't force them to go one way mm. but keep a record of what they do because you never know when you might need it and especially if you're aiming for one of like if you're aiming for Oxford or Cambridge or you're aiming for a, a, a top place or, or you're you know you want to keep it for posterity is is keep a record because if you're I, I tell the story I, I had a student who when they were very young I probably I probably got to know them when they're around four or five uh they were really interested in dinosaurs I think every kid at that point is mm. um but but they were HLP um and they're now I've known them they're like family friends so I've known them about 10 years so they mm. must be about 15 now um and that love of dinosaurs we no, originally you know parents didn't think it was interesting I remember like when I was younger kind of playing with them and, and stuff yeah. and, and and him being like you know, what do you reckon this dinosaur is um and now he's really interested in archaeology and those two things are actually fairly related yeah and parents the parents um did 
everything that I kind of advise my my parents to do which is you know find as much about something as it is and then when they're not interested about it fine you know especially when they're young you know let them try everything yeah. because they're going to come back to something at some point and when they come back to it make sure you've got a record of it because you want to be able to say oh this is what you did last time or you know they sometimes they want to look at these things so it's it's about being open and and as part of that openness um i did i did a webinar with a couple of people god about a month and a half ago um which was talking about linking up with people on linkedin so if your child is interested in becoming a I don't know, lawyer or a vet scientist find somebody who is mm. and ask them if your child can ask them a couple of questions mm. and um, if they're hlp warn them beforehand uh, <laughs> so that they're prepared <laughs> but people are sitting at home you know people aren't going to work in the same way so um you know use use as much as you have around you you probably have in your contacts if not in your contacts then in your contacts contacts someone who your child would really want to speak to mm. and someone who could be a great inspiration so reach out and, and be like the thing is, <laughs> lockdown is kind of like a blessing the whole world has stood still you yeah. can pretty much reach anyone because they're all going to be at home right now <laughs> yeah so if you want to contact your favorite author now is the time to do so because they're gonna be you know they're gonna be at home if you want to talk to somebody who's a dinosaur expert then look them up write to them write to several of them because you know one might not respond but you've got a higher chance now mm. so keep it open try and do as much as possible contact everyone you know yeah and, and that's a great way to keep the to keep students and to keep them being independent as well because they can write they can ask their questions yeah, yeah as long as they're, they're supervised on a video call they can have a video call with somebody you know yeah. there's, there's nothing to stop you doing that it's something that is quite unique about about now and I, I guess it gives them a sense of ownership and i think you've, you've kind of given three points there so the first one is um Project work. I nearly yep. forgot then. We spent, we spent ages talking about it. Project <laughs> work. Um, keeping a journal or a record of the work. I, I would say journal. We keep journals. So we get the kids to, um, even in our sessions, we have like little, little journals for, for the kids where they yeah. um, keep a record of what they're learning and their thoughts and what they're thinking and how they're finding it. Um, and I recommend that the parents do that as well. So I think it kind of aligns with what you're saying, but yours probably. Yeah more project work for the older kids um so keep a record of everything and then reach out reach yeah. out to people. reach out to people <laughs> reach out to you know everyone you know because there's going to be someone in there who who they're they're interested in meeting or you know they like the idea of their job there's going to be someone hmm. Yeah, brilliant. I think those are amazing tips there. Well, uh, thank you for that. Um, I think people are going to find that useful. Right, now to finish off, this is a part of the um, podcast where it's a challenge. So the home yep. challenge now. Um, so I've covered one of the uh, containers, the spiders covered one of the containers. So that's where I just peered off to. We didn't talk about the spider, but it's under a container right now. Um, so we've got stem left over. A's gone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably the one i wouldn't have picked so that's okay oh so which one will you... i'm trying to look at like you're gonna make me do things if it's an engineering one yeah i probably but won't I think pick the engineering might be okay okay look, i mean what you i mean i feel like i feel like i would be best suited to science but maybe i should go for math because it's it's something unusual i okay. mean the maths one's making my head hurt Oh. I have a couple of these questions that I'm like, oh. I don't know. We had um, the gymnast able to answer all three of the maths questions. Like this. Wow. And I was like, what? I'm a mathematician and I can't figure it out. No. I don't deal with that kind of thing. All right, I'm getting a pen just in case pen. I need it. Yeah, you might need a pen for this. The number of hours left today is half the number of hours already passed. What time is it? It's half. The hours passed. The number of hours left today is half the number of hours already passed. Okay, so 
if I assume that there were three hours left, there would be nine hours passed. And I assume that I just go backwards. So if it was nine o'clock, there would be three hours left. Nine hours would have passed. Well, wouldn't it be a 24 hour clock? Oh, we're streaming 24. I don't know if we're streaming 24 or 12. Hours left today is half the number of hours. Well, does it make a difference? Otherwise, it's midday. Does it make a difference? No, wait, I mean, it would... Yes, it would make a difference in the time. Isn't it a ratio, though? Isn't it like a percent? I don't, I don't, you know what? I don't know. I don't do abstract questions without writing things down. <laughs> I'm writing it down. Uh, <laughs> The Number hours hour. left is the hours left is half the hours that have passed. Yeah. Well, okay. If it was eight it, on a twelve-hour clock, there would be four hours left, and eight hours would have passed. Hmm. So that would be it for twelve-hour clock. So does that make sense for twenty-four-hour clock? That would be. Yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't work for twenty-four-hour yeah. clock? 16 and 8? You just double it. 16 and 8? 16. Is that 24? This is, this is where it gets confusing because I'm... It is 24. I have a moment. But it will, I don't think it'd be the same time. But 8pm 8, 8 is is 20 hundred. So does that mean 20 hours have passed? But then you'd only have 4 hours left. And that's not half of 20. No, so you'd have to shift it back another four hours then, right? So, yeah, so, so they won't be the same. So if it's a 12-hour clock... It's different. The ratio eight, is the same. But, yeah, the, 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 tw the ratio is the same, <laughs> but the... But I mean, basically, you do the, the thing where you go for 3x and you say that there's 24, 24 divided by 3. And now I'm trying to do maths. At, but because they're doing... They're saying today, so I assume a day is 24 hours. Okay, okay, so if 24 is 3x, 8, 16, 24, then 1x is 8, which must mean that the hours left is 8 and the hours past is 16. And they add together to give you 24. Yeah, so what time is it? 1600. Which is 4 o'clock. Is that what it says? It doesn't say 8. Yeah. There we are. 4pm. Yeah. Brilliant. You did it all like logically. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> first of all, I thought there was a clock. <laughs> I would have done it that way. Right. Uh, a tech, engineering or science question? Oh, I didn't realise there was options well, after that. Okay. Well, um, let's go for a science. Let's go Why not? I think the science are very open-ended. Um, okay. Let's have a look. Oh, we've had this a few times. Why do we dream? What's dream. your kind of perspective on this? Why do you think? It doesn't have to be a science answer, like your perspective, your kind of view on dreaming. My, okay, so well, I have this, the reason I laughed is I have this debate quite a lot with my partner because he dreams a lot and I don't remember my dreams. Mm. I'm one of those people that just falls asleep and I'm always like, oh, what was your dream? It's really interesting. Um, I feel like it's your brain being kind of overactive or your imagination kind of sh the idea of your brain. I like to think of my brain when I go to sleep as like sorting everything out as what I did today. And he's a much more of a, I would say he's much more of a creative personality. He's a musician. So he's quite different to me. And I feel like maybe my brain just sorts everything out into little boxes and his brain is always like whirring around and doing stuff. So he has more interesting dreams than me. Whereas I have dreams of like going shopping or, you know, doing work. I have, I have dreams where I just do math sums and they're very boring. And I'm, and I wake up and I'm like, why am I doing this? Um, and yeah, so I feel like, I feel like it's maybe my, my brain is maybe a bit more logical and it moves things and puts things in boxes whereas his is a lot more free and therefore he gets more interesting dreams i have crazy dreams i have dreams of dinosaurs chasing me like t-rexes I, I have dreams of, like the swarm of ladybirds chasing me i have, yeah, dreams, I of being, I have dreams of being shot 
Like I've died oh. so many times in my dreams and I hit the bed or I hit the wall and I wake and it's horrible. <laughs> See, I have none of that. And and in a way, that's quite sad because like the only dreams I can ever remember are really boring ones. I think I must have them. Want to though, like, like you, you're an emotional wreck when you wake up in the morning. <laughs> you should have like rested, but instead you've been like you've been chase it. Like you've been running all night. I think it's one of those things that that like when you have it, you don't want it, but when you don't have it, you're like, oh, but please, <laughs> missing out. <laughs> yeah, I I've feel always, like I'm missing out. I've always wondered whether, and I brought this up last time when we had this conversation, is whether when we dream, are we in someone else's? dream as well because i often have other people in a dream that i don't recognize so are they like crossing yeah because sometimes i'm in not in england and i'm somewhere else and it's a completely different area and i don't recognize it it doesn't feel like it's the uk and i'm like am i in someone else's dream somewhere else and and are these strangers crossing me having their own dream like i yeah that would be that like the idea of kind of like the matrix kind of alternate oh. reality type thing I've, I've been told i need to watch it but i've not watched it yet you should watch it. but i i always had a fun one about do you dream in your native language or when do you know that you are like what language do you dream in because i had a, a friend in secondary school who was trilingual and i always i was like what did you dream in did you dream in german or spanish or english you know what was it um because I was always like fascinated by the idea that you could speak because I couldn't I can't I I'm really rubbish at languages and I wish I was better and it's something that as I get older I want to kind of do more of but I am nowhere near fluent in any language so the idea of being able to dream in a different language to me is just like but do you dream in language though well i know that's the thing <laughs> I, I don't know if it feels different when you dream in a different language or if it's just dream now what kind of learner are you are you a visual learner or are you auditory i'm much more visual my stuff is much more visual or a bit kinesthetic so, so you, surprised when you, imagine mine. you see an image of it in your head right yeah i read recently an article that some people can't do that yeah it's like some people don't hear their own voices in their head mine talks to me all the time is that weird (laughs) it's weird though because they they were saying that if you think of red and you close your eyes we see red they don't see red they think red of the word red Ooh. maybe those people that aren't visuals are more language based and it is about the audio and it is about the language and so they think in language and they dream in language but, but, but do you speak a different language when you're with other people? Like, in a dream? Yeah. I remember once having a dream where a clown was in my house. And I remember saying to the clown, and I can't remember what language I spoke to the clown in, but I remember saying to the clown, you can't be real, this is a dream. And, yeah. he, said, and he said to me, I'm that. real. And I said, Ooh. okay, fine, we'll prove it. <laughs> and I got a pen and I wrote on my hand, I was about to write on my hand, is this a dream? And I was, I was going to prove to myself, if I wake up and that's on my hand, then it was, um, it was real. But as the pen touched my hand, I woke up. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's weird when you think you're dreaming, but you can't tell if you're, if you're dreaming or yeah. not because it feels so real. My partner says that. He's like, I... I, he's like I I so he says he, that he wakes up and he can't tell if he's awake or asleep because yeah. he's had such a vivid dream. Yeah, that he's and I don't get that. Like it's not something that I have. But do, does your day life and your dream not merge into two? If you're doing sums in your dream, don't you kind of when you're doing something when you're awake, don't you kind of go, oh, I did that, and then you're like, actually, that was my dream. Do you not kind of get no. that deja vu? I don't think so, no. I also sleep talk, which oh. maybe I, I feel like those are probably my interesting dreams, but I don't remember them. But isn't it when you're sleep talking or sleep walking when you're not actually dreaming anything? Well, I don't dream a lot. <laughs> I think that's the thing. And I think maybe I spend most of my time sleep talking. 
I used to do quite a bit of sleepwalking as well, but that's only when I'm stressed. That's really so, yeah. Maybe there's different ways that we kind of organize things, and some people dream visually. Yeah. Some people do it through audio, so they just talk. Yeah. Maybe other people are just listening, so maybe they're asleep and they can actually hear. Who knows? That'd be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> like listening. <laughs> All goes in. <laughs> But yeah, I, I mean, I have conversations in my sleep and I don't, I have no idea that I've said them. So I, I don't think that I ever would remember if I have particularly, I, I occasionally remember dreams, but I don't think that I would have, I would usually be able to remember it, even if it was interesting, because I don't remember having conversations and yet I have them. <laughs> They've been recorded. They exist. I don't think anyone remembers themselves sleep talking though. No. But but then, do sleep talkers not remember their dreams? I don't think they dream. I think it's a... Isn't, but, it, the, isn't it the science that if, if you're sleep talking or walking, you're not actually dreaming at that point? But if you are a sleep talker and you dream, do you remember your dreams? Oh, I see. So is it this that you are... If you, if you are the type of person that is a sleep talker, you just don't remember, don't like I don't remember. Mm. Or is it... Is it that you don't remember the bits when you're sleep talking? In which case, I probably, I'm, I mean, I have been told I, I talk all night. So maybe that's, maybe that's why I don't remember anything. <laughs> Just sitting there all, all day, <laughs> all night. You're really bad at keeping secrets, right? Like, as soon as you're asleep, it just all comes out. <laughs> yeah, people ask me, people ask me questions. And I just reply. In your then, sleep? Yeah, they've recorded it for me. So you can actually listen and... I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say I'm the most, I'm, I'm the most intelligent person in my sleep, but I, I reply. Um, yeah. So you're so, almost like you're hypnotized. Yeah. So my, like, I, I know because again, my partner's recorded a couple of them, but he'll say things like, Gemma, you're dreaming, go back to sleep. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I go back to sleep. Just <laughs> he goes, stop yelling. I'm like, all right. Sometimes I wake up and go, I, so I, the, the times that I do remember, um, I wake up usually and go, there's someone in the room, or I will, I screamed in my sleep, I do all those kind of things, and he gets really annoyed at it, because it will wake him up, and he's a light sleeper, so he'll be up for ages, and then he'll be like, go back to sleep, and I'm like, alright, <laughs> I'm really annoying. Oh, it's been a it's been amazing talking to you. <laughs> um, uh, I I don't I don't even know how long we've been talking, but I think we've gone over. Um, right. But it's been great. I think yeah. I've learned so much about you, and yeah. it's amazing how we've known each other for such a long time, but we've never actually spoken. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I we see each other a lot on Facebook, but not not anywhere else. And yeah, it's, it's been nice. I think joy uh, of the lockdown. Yeah, it's because of the lockdown. I know lockdown has so many blessings, even though there's so much happening out there at the moment, which is so sad. But I think we should take advantage of this opportunity that we've got to spend time with family and to spend time at home and, and to just to enjoy. Connect. And yeah. to connect, yeah. Um, so if people want to reach you, because you mentioned a lot of things that you do, um, is there anything exciting coming up at the moment that you want to share? Um, yeah, uh, it's very new. So this is, this is you're the first person I've told about it, um, is, uh, recently working on doing some subscription boxes. Oh, wow. So boxes that are going to be sent out with, um, I mentioned the project based learning. So some of that, um, is starting to come out, um, as well as some revision boxes and, and some kind of bits that are in the pipeline. They're, they're kind of edging closer, but, uh, but, but yeah, those are those are the bits I'm quite excited about at the moment. Oh, I'm gonna have to work with you on that because <laughs> I've wanted to do some boxes for a while. It's just getting all the resources together. It's just such a pain doing it on your own when you don't when you have your own deadlines. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because you're like, I'll do that later. I can just tutor now because that's a closer deadline. <laughs> yeah. But, so I think the the project based stuff is is something I'm quite excited about. I think I've got. Yeah, I think it's gonna get there. Ooh. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, so if people want to find out more about that and some of the stuff that you're doing or want to reach out for support, um, how can they do that? So I run the Education Hotel, 
the Education Hotel is online. Um, we're also based in Oxford and that's www.educationhotel.com or .co.uk. That will both go to us. Um, for the boxes, it's really, really new. Um, so it's just www.myschoolboxes.com. Um, at My the moment, boxes. my school boxes. School. So that's school boxes. School. Um, so the majority of what we do is about revision boxes. Um, but there are some project based stuff that's coming along. Um, at the moment, the mailing list is just for 11 plus. Uh, so we've got some 11 plus stuff coming up. Um, and we're doing some revision boxes for that. But we are looking at expanding um, following some, some kind of interesting feedback and bits. So that's where that information will be, hopefully, within the next couple of weeks. Brilliant. Um, so you heard it here first, guys. Yeah. So if you've been listening in and you've listened in to the end, uh, you've heard about uh, Gemma's amazing boxes on the Home Ed Me podcast. <laughs> so hopefully uh, you've enjoyed that. It's been um, a pleasure to have you on today. Um, and, I, and I know you've had a long day as well. So uh, thank you for um, taking out the time. Um, and guys, we'll be back next week for with another show. So we're going to have session number six. We've got exciting guests coming in. Um, I think it's forensics next week. Ooh, that was what I wanted to do as a child when I was younger. That and was my ideal job. <laughs> workshops for adults as well as kids. So you could like maybe log into one of her workshops. <laughs> I do that. I want to do that so much. <laughs> She is joining us next week, um, next Thursday at 3.30. So thank you guys for watching Home Ed Me podcast every Thursday for home editors, for parents, for educators, and anyone that works with kids. So thank you guys. Bye.